The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Lisa Pacciuti, an oncology social worker here in the Carol G. Simon Cancer Center at Morristown Medical Center, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar entitled Palliative Care Through Cancer Treatment, Not Just for End of Life, presented by Bridget Nicholson of our Outpatient Palliative Care Program. Let me introduce Bridget to you. Bridget Nicholson is the nurse practitioner for the Outpatient Palliative Care Program at the Carol G. Simon Cancer Center at Morristown Medical Center. Bridget was an oncology nurse practitioner for over 10 years prior to this role and has had a special interest in symptom management and supportive care through cancer treatment. Bridget graduated from the University of Michigan School of Nursing. She's an oncology certified nurse through the Oncology Nursing Society and is certified through the American Nurse Credentialing Center. Today's presentation will be in listen-only mode, but you can ask questions at any time via the question box on the webinar toolbar. We'll gather the questions throughout the program and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. Now to Bridget. Good afternoon. Um, thank, you for, thank you for joining us. Um, Today we're going to talk about palliative care through cancer treatment and um, not just, it's not just for end of life um, and my credentials are there. Our objectives today are to de define the concept of palliative care, define the objectives of pal the palliative care clinic at Morristown Hospital and um, we have a, a sister clinic at Overlook Hospital as well. Uh, and define hospice care in the context of palliative care. What is palliative care? Palliative care is specialized medical care for people with serious illnesses. It focuses on providing patients with relief from the symptoms, from the symptoms, pain, and stress of a serious illness, whatever the diagnosis. The goal is to improve quality of life for both the patient and the family. That is um, the quote from getpalliativecare.org, which is an excellent resource. I'll, you'll see it throughout my presentation. Um, it's, it's an excellent resource for patients and families to uh, help patients understand what palliative care is and decide if it's right for, for the patient and the family. <clears throat> Palliative care is patient and family-centered care that optimizes quality of life by anticipating, I think that's key, preventing and treating suffering. Palliative care through the continuum of the illness involves addressing physical, intellectual, emotional, social, and spiritual needs and facilitates the patient's autonomy, access to information, and choices. Ultimately, what, what this is the this is saying is our real focus is the whole person. A person doesn't become an illness. A person, a person is not the illness that they are. And, and I think at the Carol Simon Cancer Center, we've always been very focused on that. But palliative care is also very focused on the whole person navigating through the illness. Palliative care is specialized care to support patients and family through serious illness. Complex symptom management through oncology care. And when we talk about symptom management in oncology care, we really focus on several big symptoms. Um, fatigue, nausea, vomit, nausea, vomiting, pain, um, and dyspnea. Um, there's also the psychosocial stress that's very, very important. Um, palliative care includes symptom management for early and advanced illness. Later I'll give you some examples of both of these. So, so hopefully to expand your concept of who's being seen in the palliative care clinic and therefore who, whom else could be seen in the palliative care clinic. Palliative care is not hospice. Hospice is a wonderful organization. Hospice, ca hospice care helps patients through the end of their illness. Hospice care is often called the last chapter of palliative care, but it is not its entirety. Specifically, palliative care is excellent evidence-based medical treatment. The, rec the recommended uh, interventions are those that are studied, evaluated, and used as appropriate for patients. It involves vigorous care of pain and symptoms through, throughout the illness and care that 
patients want and receive at the same time as efforts to prolong or, or cure their, prolong their life or cure their illness. I think this is a very important point, uh, meaning that palliative care can be uh, used alongside of either curative chemotherapy or palliative chemotherapy and palliative radiation. Um, patients can be helped with symptoms throughout both of these courses, uh, whether or not um, their, whatever their outcome could be. Palliative care is not giving up on the patient, and it is not in place of curative or life-prolonging life care. And again, it's not the same as hospice. Who provides palliative care? Um, palliative care is provided by doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplains, in conjunction with integrative practitioners, nutritionists. Really, uh, I think nurses provide a lot of palliative care without even knowing it. Social workers provide a lot of palliative care. Um, now they're more formally joining palliative care teams, but this has been going on for years in the hospital before they were recognized formally. What is palliative care at Atlantic Health? Um, so. As a, as a new conglomerate of hospitals, we have inpatient services available for acute symptom management and goals of care discussions. At Morristown Memorial Hospital, this includes our team of um, Dr. Karen Knops, Dr. Reggie Saldivar, and our, um, our palliative care nurse, um, Terry Vicentainer. We're very proud of these people. <laughs> they work hard every day and help transition people to outpatient services at Morristown Room Medical Center. Uh, we also have available uh, outpatient services at Overlook Medical Center in the Carol Simon Cancer Center. This is a program that's being supported by our, um, our cancer center to, for symptom management and goals of care discussions. This includes nurse practitioner services. It also, we have available social work services uh, who are a part, work as a part of the social work, a part of the palliative care team. We additionally have um, the support of pastoral care, counselors. So we're really attempting to round out our services for palliative care patients. Outpatient services at, at Morristown uh, are, are available for the Carol Simon Cancer Center patients. Um, there's a nurse practitioner, me, available for consultation and or continued management of patient symptoms. Ultimately, there are patients who are seen for their symptoms, particularly patients who are curative, that can be seen several times. Their, uh, their symptom can be managed appropriately, and then they can be discharged back to their primary oncologist. Should their, during their course of illness, they, they need palliative care in the future, six months down the road, a year down the road, ideally those patients will return to, that, return to us. Um, it is available for the support of patients during transitions of care. The course of cancer illness can be a tumultuous roller coaster for patients, and their needs are different at each, at each point during, during their care. Ultimately, patients go through many transitions, particularly their needs in performing their activities of daily living and functioning within their life. Patients come to us with many constraints. They, um, they have steps in their house and um, a dog and things that we, we need to really understand about them so that we can help make their transitions as safe as possible. Um, and we, work, we do this through working with a team of oncologists, physicians, primary care physicians, social workers, nutritionists, and, and nurses. I think I forgot to say nurses. Um, can't forget about our nurses. Who needs palliative care? Um, patients with difficult uh, to manage symptoms or heavy symptom burden. Uh, and this brings me to the second point. A lot of the times these patients wind up in the emergency room. They come, they come back to the emergency room for, for multiple episodes of um, uncontrolled nausea, uncontrolled pain. Even two emergency room visits within short span 
is, is something that should be looked at for palliative care. Um, patients who have family, family who have difficulty coordinating care or have conflicting goals. Um, because we have social worker support and we're able to access all these resources within the Cancer Center, we can assist with coordinating care. Um, palliative care, any patient is, is appropriate for any patient with a stage 4 cancer. What data is there to support <clears throat> sending your patients to palliative care? I think that's a reasonable question. Um, in 2010 was kind of the landmark study that cha changed how people looked at palliative care um, somewhat. Um, in 2010 at Massachusetts General Hospital, they randomized 151 non-small cell lung cancer patients. So lung cancer patients. They were randomized to standard oncology care versus oncology care plus concurrent palliative care. So alongside um, collaborative palliative care. These patients went on to see the palliative provider at least monthly <clears throat> alongside their oncology care. The results showed in the palliative arm um, decreased rate of, rates of depression, decreased, decreased aggressive end-of-life care, which was fitting with what patients desired. Not, we didn't just say, we're not going to do this. This was, this was based on the patient's wishes and goals. Improved symptom control, they measured nausea, dyspnea, pain, and pain primarily. And a longer period on hospice, um, it does, uh, 11 versus 4 days, which is more than double, which is impressive. So ultimately, this study showed really that the patients that, that were on the palliative arm had a better quality of life. Um, Surprisingly, maybe for some, um, it also showed an increased survival. Showed 11.3 months with palliative and oncology care versus 8.6 months with oncology care alone. This is this makes you ask yourself, what does this mean? Well, this means the patients with palliative care and usual oncology care lived almost three months longer. I think for the um, the nurse in us and the social work it, worker in us, this. This seems rather intuitive because what we're saying is we really focused on these patients decreasing the stress of their serious illness. By doing that and making patients feel better, we ultimately improved the, they ultimately improved their longevity. Now, is this is, is this a this is not likely to be extrapolated for individual patients? Clearly, this is one study. Um, again, the palliative care in addition to usual oncology care, allowed lung cancer patients to have an Im improved quality of life. And I think for our patients, this is really important because when you ask them how they're functioning throughout their illness, the answer is, well, it often, I've heard, well, it feels like I, I have one good day and then I have another bad day and I just don't know what's coming. So the ability to speak to the fact that will be there for the progression through what's coming, I think is very important for patients. So ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncologists, they, um, they had a panel expert consensus that, that looks at these results. They also make recommendations for oncology care generally. And based on these studies results, um, they recommended that when combined with standard cancer care or as the main focus of care, that palliative care leads to better patient and caregiver outcomes. They also said that earlier involvement of palliative care leads to more appropriate referral and use of hospice and reduced use of futile intensive care. Their consensus is that combined standard oncology care and palliative care should be considered early in the course of illness for any patient with metastatic cancer and or high symptom burden. So this is a group of oncology, oncologists recommending palliative care. So what, what would we do, uh, what does the palliative care involve is the question I, I get sometimes. What can you do for me? Um, the 
ultimately we're going to look at it, your advanced directive. The advanced directive is a document that states your wishes nearing the end of life. We're going to talk about the advanced directive document further later in this program. Be able to follow up on the wishes regarding code status. Code status refers to CPR and intubation. Um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation as well as intubation, which uh, is most often performed in an emergency situation um, in the field or when patients tend to decompensate and then get transferred to the ICU. Um, so we're able to explain what code, is, code status is to patients because there are learning gaps in that surrounding that issue, and then follow up on their wishes surrounding that. It's typically in the outpatient, not a conversation that occurs all at one time. Um, unfortunately, at the in, in the inpatient, it has, to, it has to occur all at one time often because we need to make decisions based on deteriorating status. Um, assessing pain, other symptoms, including distressing um, psychological symptoms, and collaboration with the primary care and oncology physician to facilitate understanding of the disease process. Uh, many, many clinicians start, start their conversations with, what do you know about your disease process? What do you know about what's happening with your body? And understanding, the patient's understanding of that can be very telling as to what, what they think is happening and, and, and whether their goals of care then are aligned um, with what is actually happening. And then understanding the role of hospice and other supportive care programs. What would a palliative care consult address? Uh, this would speak to the idea, are there um, distressing physical or psychological symptoms? Um, and, and physicians, uh, oncologists, they, these are addressed in these offices. So, um, so it can be some duplications. We try not to duplicate. We try to, try to manage. Um, the symptoms that, that palliative care is managing uh, to the extent that we can and then send people back to their oncologist if need be, if, if, if they really don't need additional support from palliative care. Are there significant social or spiritual concerns affecting daily life? Again, understanding the prognosis and treatment options. Um, does the family understand the current illness and the prognostic trajectory? I think um, this is a very strong sticking point. Patients I, sometimes are under the impression that they're getting curative, um, curative treatment when they're actually getting palliative radiation or palliative chemotherapy, meaning we're trying to delay the progression of their disease or make symptom, improve their symptom control with, with chemotherapy. Uh, when they're, they, they, they're under the impression that they're being cured. Now, patients um, are under that impression, not because they've not been told often what their actual um, treatment options are, but typically the understanding that patients have really decreases after they're told bad or um, shocking news. So when they meet with their oncologist or uh, primary care physician or whoever's delivering news to them or are in the hospital, Patients hear what they say, they hear the word cancer, and then it's very difficult to absorb the details. As, as we all, when we get stressed, we have difficulty absorbing these details. So this, uh, this palliative care allows them to circle back on um, what's been told to them by their physician and create a greater understanding. What are the goals of care as identified by the patient and family? Are the treatment options map, matched to informed patient-centered goals? Sometimes patients go, they see their oncologist, they say they agree to chemotherapy, and then I've, I've been told they don't really want chemotherapy, but felt that that's what they should do because that was what the doctor was recommending. So just having that conversation, is this, why would this frighten you? It, are there particular needs that are specific to you surrounding um, this course of treatment. Has the, patient's, um, has the patient participated in advanced care planning process? 
we're going to we're going to speak to that later as well has the patient completed an advanced care planning document um, transitions of care post discharge I think even transitions of care during, you know, during discharge, um, but in the outpatient we're dealing with post-discharge and navigating the, the outpatient world, you know, in a world where we're trying to um, make appropriate discharge plans so the patients aren't readmitted. Um, what are the key considerations for a safe and sustainable transition from one setting to another discharge plan? So do we not only have a plan, but if that plan doesn't work out, what is our secondary plan? What would your palliative consult address? Um, well, it would address what is most increasing the stress and burden of disease for you, the patient. Essentially, sometimes I ask patients, what's the hardest part about living with this illness? The clinic goals are to add an extra layer of support for outpatient oncology patients in the Carol G. Simon Cancer Centers, um, to improve symptom management for patients with difficult to control symptoms, and to facilitate earlier goals of care conversations. Who's being seen in the clinic? I like these examples because they, they give you some sense of the, the variety of patients that we're seeing. Um, this is one example. She's a 64-year-old female with a history of gynecological cancer. She's status post-chemotherapy. She is, at this point, considered uh, on surveillance, had curative chemotherapy, and she emerged with a, a symptom that is very bothersome for her, which is significant neuropathy. It's, have, um, it's making um, her have gait changes, difficulty with toleration of some of the activities she'd like to perform. And um, above this, she's also having guilt that she's complaining about this because she feels that she should just be thankful that she's cured. So um, we've, we've gone ahead and used medication. She's had some improvement um, on that. Uh, and we're moving through topical creams to see which are helpful for her, having compounding pharmacy, using compounding pharmacies for the topical neuropathic creams, and exploring the thought of physical therapy for neuropathy. Additionally, we're giving her emotional support that it's okay to be frustrated by her change in functional status, and, I, um, and I'm not sure that that's not the most helpful part for her. Um, so that's one example. Um, another example is an 84-year-old gentleman with head and neck cancer. He's, at this point, he is unwilling to tolerate additional treatment. He completed radiation therapy. He did not want to pursue uh, additional chemotherapy because of his age and performance status. And he was seen for goal to, goals of care. Our interventions were to manage the acute pain. We considered veterans hospice, um, comfort care at home for payment reasons, versus hospice at home and weighed the benefits of each with the patient and family. Emotional support was provided in conjunction with, uh, with the social worker. Ultimately, the patient elected hospice at home and he did, he did pass peacefully at home. How, this, is my, this is my sales pitch here. How can palliative care help you? Are you struggling with symptom control, nausea, shortness of breath, pain, fatigue, or loss of appetite? Trying to make decisions regarding continuing care, weighing the benefits of treatment options, weighing the caregiver burden slash support. Um, this is how you can reach us for a palliative care evaluation. Reach me for a palliative care evaluation. Um, this is uh, our contact info at the Carol Simon Cancer Center at Morristown. I certainly am happy to get you the contact info at, at Overlook if that is an easier location for you. Just go ahead and give me a call, and, and, and we will absolutely get that out to you. So palliative care is not only end-of-life care, but is also there to assist with end-of-life care. That discussion that palliative care is the final, or that hospice care is the final chapter of palliative care. Sometimes palli uh, hospice care is not the final chapter. Sometimes comfort care is the final chapter of, of palliative care. So let's talk about end-of-life care. Why is palliative care needed? Because there's a disparity between the way 
people die in the way they want to die. Um, I think the statistics is, are that most people want to die at home. Uh, most people don't die at home. Um, and if you ask people about their, the death that they envision, it's it sometimes is not con congruent with our hosp the way patients pass away in the hospital. Um, lack of knowledge by the patient and family in the choices of treatment. Why do we need advanced care planning? Um, so advanced care planning, the goal of advanced care planning is to um, help make the patient's uh, wishes known so that we can, we're able to facilitate the patient's wishes. Advanced care planning often includes family members and designated advocates, and we'll talk about those. Um, and the, the, the family members often state their concern regarding making choices for their family member. Really, our focus would be that the patient has made the choices, but with an advanced care plan, the family member is really just speaking for the patient. If they, if they could sit up in bed and tell us what they wanted, what would they say? Because you know them, because the family members should know the patient better than us. The life expectancy has increased significantly, with many patients reaching to their 90s. There's an increased prevalence of chronic disease and an increased number of treatments for cancer. So patients will often progress through multiple lines of treatment with diminishing functional status sometimes throughout those lines of treatment. There, there are many advanced technologies that are offered and not all of them are beneficial. And um, most importantly, why we need advanced care planning is because New Jersey is, is rated number one in excessive ICU care in the last six months of life and poor quality end of life care. And this is, we can look at this from many, many layers. Uh, this is usually looked at from a cost layer. What bothers me is a particularly is, is that this is incongruent with what patients want at the end of life. Mo very few patients say, I want to spend my last hours in the, in the intensive care unit. In fact, I've never heard a patient say that. So things get turned around if you don't make plans. This is our attempt at humor. What happens, and this is an educational piece I, for families and clinicians, what happens when you call 911 for help? You are a stage, stage four lung cancer patient who's been undergoing chemotherapy for the last 10 months, doing relatively well, and you're having excessive shortness of breath. When the EMS comes to your home, they do not have any of that information. They're, they're, they're operating on their, their, best, their best guess, and they're always there to do all medical interventions that are provided. So there's no time for evaluation, there's no time for patient preferences, and there's typically no goals of care identified. This is a high-speed train unless the preferences are documented and visible. Oops. What happens when the train starts in motion? Um, this talks about CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, so when, if your heart were to stop, you were just have difficulty breathing. The response by medical workers is to perform CPR and to put a tube down your throat and typically transfer to the ICU. Historically, the CPR success rate in cancer patients has been thought to be less than 2%, and that's from the Center to Advance Palliative Care. Ultimately, um, they did a longitudinal study that looked at uh, post-analysis um, over about... Uh, 40 years, and it was found to be about, in actuality, it can be six, approximately 6%. The 2% are for patients that start in the ICU. So patients who are found in the, uh, wind up in the ICU de novo, um, have a less than 2% chan chance of being resuscitated. They also looked at quality of life issues, and, and in cancer patients, patients who have advanced cancer, there's significant quality of life issues following a resuscitation event. There are 
um, again, all these statistics I'm speaking of are in, cancer, in patients with metastatic cancer. How do we avoid this? <clears throat> we discuss preferences for end of life with family and providers before there's an event up, up front. It's a, it is a difficult conversation. More and more, though, patients are looking at uh, how, how they discuss these things with their family. There's a lot of, been a lot of media activity surrounding this. Um, the Conversation Project is a great website. It's at the end of my slides. Um, and it, it has a, they have a starter kit where you can order and try to facilitate the conversation with your family. Um, there are other resources. Palliative, getpalliative.org has resources available on their website. Secondarily, these documents need to be, uh, these preferences need to be documented in the advanced directive or the PULSE, which is Physician's Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment in the state of New Jersey. Um, this is a one-slide question to, to start a discussion with your family member. It's from the engagewithgrace.org. Um, this asks, on a scale of one to, one to five, where do you fall on this con continuum and on the um, I don't know if you can see me if I point here, but on the on the left side it says let me die without medical intervention and don't give me up on me no matter what and try any proven or unproven intervention. Um, this is very telling very quickly for patients. If there was a choice, would you prefer to die at home or in the hospital? Could a loved one correctly describe how you'd like to be treated in the case of a terminal illness? And is there someone you trust who you've appointed an advocate on your behalf? And have you completed any of the following, um, written a living will, appointed a healthcare power of attorney, or complete, uh, completed an advanced directive? You can. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the advanced directive. Um, so the advanced directive is a document which outlines the patient's wishes regarding to health care and quality of life. It is rather... Um, rather vague, uh, and it, it as we'll speak to, it only gets enacted um, when the patient loses capacity to make decisions themselves. The healthcare proxy, or the medical power of attorney, is a document that gives a specific person the power to make healthcare decisions when the patient loses capacity. What if you have an uh, advanced directive living will proxy? It, becomes operational only when the patient is determined to have lost decision-making capacity and when it actually comes to the hospital, which I find is the most difficult step. Someone has it in a drawer somewhere, which is very helpful, except that we can't read it. Uh, when there's been adequate time for a diagnosis and prognosis and adequate time for evaluation and interpretation of the patient's preferences. So this is a lot of, this is really a lot of moving pieces. Uh, and also, the advanced directive remains remains interpretable. So uh, it depends on uh, prognosis uh, and multiple multiple levels of um, communication through the provider to make sure that the patient gets the right information. Uh, <clears throat> that brings us to our other option. So what is a PULST? Uh, New Jersey has implemented uh, practitioner's orders for life-sustaining treatment. The, the PULST is um, a document that allows patients to delineate their preferences. It speaks to um, goals of care. So the first category is uh, what are the goals of care? Patients are allowed to really write anything that they want. Uh, I've had patients tell me that they want to be at home. Um, that's the goal. I want to be at home and functional as long as possible. So we, we write that. It's, it's really not, uh, it feels a little awkward. It feels like you should be um, not just writing what you think. It feels like you should be writing in some specific language, but it really allows for clear, um, clear and concise language. It requires a comprehensive converse, conversation with the patient and clinical caregivers about their goals of care and medical conditions. It then, yeah. It then goes on to to evaluate medical interventions, um, and it offers options of full treatment, limited treatment, and symptom treatment only. This is filled out, and then it, it might change in three months, 
but we have the document and we're able to say, you told me initially that you wanted full treatment, but things have changed and become harder for you. Would you, would you like to discuss the other possibilities? Um, it also speaks to artificial nutrition and fluids and whether or not the patient want, wants cardiopulmonary resuscitation and airway manage, management intubation. It, it allows the patient to make a designation of who their decision maker, surrogate decision maker would be, and then it allows them to say whether the decision maker gets to change this document or not. So if the patient feels that they have uh, made an adequate decision maker, but feels that as as patients have told me, they might go soft in the end. They, they can say that this patient is not allowed to change this document, which is an interesting conversation. Um, I think I did some of this before. Um, so the, the POLS is different than the advanced directive because it does not require a loss of decision-making capacity uh, to be put in place. It's a set of actionable medical orders. It's, it transcends, um, it transcends types of care environments. So it, it, it goes with a patient from home. It can be shown to the EMS. If they do not want to be resuscitated, it can be shown to the EMS. And um, it can also um, go to the assisted living with them, and it can go uh, into the hospital. It's created by a healthcare pra uh, practitioner with the patient and or surrogate. It applies immediately. So if I sit down with a patient on a Tuesday afternoon and we do this pulse, it is immediately, um, it is immediately effective. Uh, it provides explicit direction about resuscitation, and it includes directions about other life-sustaining treatment, intubation, antibiotics, tube feeding, etc. The sections that aren't completed will default to full treatment if they're not completed. It's just one thing to know. Who should have a pulse? Anyone who would not want to be resuscitated and would choose a natural death, choose to allow a natural death. Um, anyone choosing to limit medical interventions, that they don't want intubation, feeding tubes, dialysis, antibiotics. The frail elderly and terminally ill, uh, which uh, bring, is uh, the same as the bottom point, I think, anyone expected to die within a few years or less. Um, and patients with stage 4 cancer, uh, th and those res residing in a long-term care facility. So the goal of these documents is really to pre prevent um, us having the conversation with patients about how, what their end-of-life preferences are in the same day or three days before they pass away. Really having these conversations when patients are feeling well, when they can clearly delineate those, those choices, is very important. Making sure that we understand their preferences is, is so important. I had a patient, um, uh, and she was a, she was a very, she was a 54-year-old patient with recurrent lung cancer with met, METs to the brain. And I saw her when she came in originally, and she was um, doing very well, living at home, working, um, and was, was seen in the emergency room um, by a physician who, 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 because of her brain metastasis, asked her if she was enrolled in hospice. She was very upset by this. However, I think it pushed her forward. Really, I think it was defining in her, in her care. Um, I think sometimes bringing up things that the, the messenger gets gets um, in trouble, but it's sometimes helpful for the patients actually. Um, she went on to be readmitted twice for hypercalcemia and continued to have difficulty correcting this problem. And as she was readmitted, she would stay for uh, five days a week and, and become weaker. She was then transferred to a long-term care facility because her husband felt he couldn't take on the care of her total care was, was what she needed. And he called me one morning and he said, I don't know whether to bring her back and get calcium. And the patient and I had filled out a pulse document. And her goals of care had been, I want to be as, at home as long as possible. I know that this illness is going to take my life. I want to be at home and I want to be functional. And when that is no longer possible, I, that's what I want. She um, 
I had the luxury of knowing this patient very well. I, um, I was able to say to her husband, I think, I, think to, I think the patient was very clear about her goals, and ultimately he elected at that point to change her, as, his, as her designated decision maker on the post, to change her document to say that she would not want to be readmitted and pursued comfort care at that point. And really, this is, this, is, this is not a happy story. We see sad stories every day. But the happy part of the story is, is that the patient's wishes were honored. And when we talk about honoring patients' wishes, we need, we need to talk about hospice care because hospice care is a part of many, the end of many people's palliative care chapters. So what's the difference? Palliative care is focused on preventing and relieving distressing symptoms, really as it's hospice care. Um, and the goal is to maintain optimal quality of life for patients and their family. But really the difference is that palliative care can be used in conjunction with curative treatments regardless of disease stage. Um, and it's available at the Carol Simon Cancer Center. Um, <laughs> the hospice care um, is considered the last chapter of palliative care. Hospice is an... Uh, Um, hospice is um, used when curative treatments are no longer working. Um, it's an agency that assists in patient care. So hospice is not a place. It can be a place. It can be an inpatient facility, but it is not a place. Um, it's, a, it's an agency that, that can follow patients from different um, places of care. It uses a team approach, as does palliative care, and it, but the thing that hospice is able to do is it supports patients and families with bereavement services for 13 months after the death of a loved one. There's four levels of hospice. There's routine home hospice, which I get multiple questions about um, uh, on a daily basis. Home hospice is provided by a team of uh, nurses, social workers, uh, chaplains, uh, they come to your home. Typically, the nurse comes once or twice a week, depending on the burden of symptoms. They are able to give some caregiver hours, but it is not custodial care, meaning it, the patient remains the, the, the caregiver, um, and there's no one that stays with the patient at all times, no um, skilled personnel that stay with the patient at all times. General inpatient hospice is the ICU of hospice care. This is for things that cannot be done at home or a facility. Patients are not, it is difficult to qualify for inpatient hospice. It is only when you are unable to control patient symptoms at home. Respite care is provided under the hospice umbrella for um, a number of days to help uh, with caregiver burden and stress. Um, and then continuous hospice care is um, in, in a facility typically. Um, there is a payment often associated for the room and board fee, I guess is the easiest way to describe it. This is a slide that I really like because it just displays all of the services that hospice is able to provide. I particularly like to point out to patients that they do do physical therapy, occupational therapy, because the real goal of hospice is to maximize patients' capacity to feel as well as possible as long as possible. Um, nursing visits, 24-hour uh, on-call. This physical therapy, though, it does require that we, our patients go to hospice early enough to, to utilize those services. Um, I think that's the end of my presentation. I wanted to list some resources, including the Conversation Project, which uh, you can download the starter kit or just peruse their website for, for stories. The Engage with Grace, which is the one slide project that offers the five questions to get this conversation started. GetPalliativeCare.org, uh, which is uh, the website that I referenced several times. And then the, uh, for hospice information, the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization is, is very good. Um, we'd be ha I'd be happy to take any questions if anyone has any questions. Okay, um, so some questions. What services are covered for home hospice? Uh, what about facility care? I think I did add this into my kind of presentation, but we, uh, 
home hospice is a nurse uh, will come in, the medications will be provided for you, the bed uh, that you need, the walker, any, any supplies will be brought to your home without you, you or your family member going out for them. Those are all covered. Um, they typically can, hospice can typically provide an aid for several hours, um, several days a week. That's about two hours, two to three days a week. Uh, Typically, uh, the, one of the main concerns patients bring to me is, is that's not enough time I need to go to work. Caregivers bring to me is that's not enough time. How can I get more time? There, you can pay for additional um, supportive care, uh, assistive personnel time, um, but typically that's a payment. Um, facility, hospice facility care, uh, typically, again, has a room and board fee. They cover all the medications. They cover uh, all the nursing care, but the, the room and board fee typically does apply. Um, occasionally, that can be covered with long-term care insurance if someone has uh, a, a, doc, a, a policy. Um, next question. Can I fill out my own post? Um, so the post needs to be signed by your physician. It is very user-friendly. The instructions are on the back. Um, but it is recommended that you fill it out with your, with your provider. Um, and if, if, if you were to fill it out at home, which is not recommended, you would certainly have to review it with your provider so that they can sign it and, and, and uh, make it valid. You do, not need a, uh, you do not need an attorney's signature, though, for that document to be valid. Um, it's unlike an advanced directive. Um, what's the difference between hospice care and comfort care? Um, so hospice care is, again, an agency that comes on and, and adds uh, nurses and social work support. And um, comfort care can be the idea, it's a concept, that we're pursuing comfort, we are not doing unnecessary things. It can be largely interpreted in different ways, unlike hospice, who, who has a pretty um, consistent set of guidelines and, and, and um, techniques that are used throughout an, a, an agency. And comfort care is kind of at the interpretation of the physician um, where the patient is being um, treated. But the idea is, the concept is, is that we're promoting as much comfort for the patient as we can and not doing unnecessary things. Um, okay. Um, if anyone doesn't have any other questions, I think I'm going to end the webinar. And I thank you very much for attending. And certainly, um, should you have any questions that you think of later or have patients that need assistance, certainly you can get in touch with their physician and have them refer directly to us. You can, if you're a patient, you can ask your physician about palliative care, um, or you can certainly give me a call and we can discuss how I might be, we might be helpful and then we can reach out to your physician. Thank you very much. That's the end of our program today. Thank you so much, Bridget. That was so much information, I think we're going to have to take some time to digest all of it. Um, to our audience later on, we're going to send you a follow-up email. Use it, please, to send your comments or feedback on today's program and give us ideas for future programs. So thank you for joining us.